From rolling farmland in the 1940s to a military powerhouse today, Redstone Arsenal has changed the landscape of Huntsville. Redstone's always been proactive and we've, we've found ways to reinvent ourselves and we will continue to do that. It's Redstone Through the Decades, sponsored by Wholesale Jewelry and Redstone Federal Credit Union. Good evening, I'm Bill Young. And I'm Demetria McClinton. As we approach the 75th anniversary of Redstone Arsenal, we're taking a look at where it was, what it has become, and what it means to the community. Where we're standing was once rolling farmland populated by people and animals on plantations. Several archaeological sites have been discovered here over the years. Here's a photo of the arsenal's groundbreaking. You can still see the remains of sharecropper homes around the installation. RedstoneAlabama.com's Holly Thrasher has been meeting with historians and leaders on post to get their perspective on the long and unique history of the installation. She joins us now from where it all started. Holly. Yeah, this is the location of the old munitions facility. Back in the 1940s, you would see buildings here, buildings where women worked, creating munitions to contribute to the war effort. And the work they started back then continues to this day. Transportation, you had water, you had rail. In 1941, the Army decided this piece of land in North Alabama was a perfect location for their chemical manufacturing facility. The world was at war, and it would not be long before America was as well. Huntsville Arsenal manufactured the chemical munitions. Redstone Arsenal loaded them into the shells. 40,000 acres. Everything west of Patton Road was Huntsville Arsenal. Everything east was Redstone Arsenal. 20,000 women manufactured chemicals and loaded them into bombs and shells for use overseas. And they excelled, always meeting goals and ultimately beginning Redstone's tradition of excellence. But when the war came to an end, Redstone and Huntsville Arsenals almost did as well. They began to demill de the both facilities. Michael Baker, known as Mule, has been the Redstone historian for decades. The townspeople went into an effort of trying to find uh, what what to do with this land. There were there was an effort to possibly bring what became the Arnold Engineering Center in Tennessee down here. We. They also tried to manufacture cars here. Land was leased out to companies and farmers. Generations later, cows still grazed the open fields. But finally, a plan. At that time, a colonel later became Major General Holger Nelson Toftoy. Uh, was in the rocket branch and at the Pentagon, and he, he led the effort to consolidate the Army's rocket mission, which was done that decision was made in October 1948. All of the Army's rocket missions were consolidated onto the southeast portion of the arsenal. Then came Operation Paperclip, the secret recruitment of German scientists. The decision was made to bring the Von Braun team here. They felt that this would be an area that would be conducive to woodwork as far as the testing. Uh, General Toftoy went to the vice chief of staff and literally as he said he had a map and he crawled around on the floor showing him the map saying look sir I'm literally on my knees begging for this place. Von Brown and his team arrived and Huntsville would never be the same. They essentially came here as prisoners of peace as they were called initially to study the the rocket and guided missile program in which was in its infancy in those days in its infancy, but about to go through a major growth spurt. The Von Brown team got to work and what they would accomplish would change the world. We now jump ahead to the 1950s. The Korean War took place from 1950 till 1953. The ammunition used was made right here in Huntsville. More than 38 million rounds were made. This decade also brought a name change and brand new projects. Let's check in with Redstone Alabama's Holly Thrasher. By the 1950s, the two areas known as Huntsville Arsenal and Redstone Arsenal had been combined into one and renamed Redstone Arsenal. It was a time when the real rocket work would begin and two men would lead the way. General John Bruce Medeiros and Warner Von Braun were two of the men who would change the world, scientifically speaking. With Operation Paperclip came German and American scientists and they came in droves. The Cold War was beginning with the Russians and the foundations of what is now the U.S. space program were being laid by the United States Army. Redstone was probably in the national spotlight more than any other time in its history. Medeiros headed up the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. In the late 1950s, the, the roots of what is now 
the Space and Missile Defense Command and the Missile Defense Agency, the Missile Space and Intelligence Center were all being worked on here. Lieutenant General David Mann is now commander of what is now known as the Space and Missile Defense Command. In, in October of 1957, uh, the command really got its beginning, and uh, it was the anti-missile missile systems office back then. You had the Redstone, the Jupiter, the early work on the Pershing, the Hawk. Lessons learned from World War II were facilitating the new rocketry, but everything created was not meant to stay on Earth. Von Braun's focus was first defense, but space was never far from his mind. The Redstone and the Jupiters both had space applications in addition to their their capabilities for defense. But America was behind. U.S. prestige was on the line. We had we had nothing. In 1957, the Russians were the first to make it to space with the launch of Sputnik. The story goes that the public affairs officer came in to announce that uh, that the Russians had launched the satellite and. Von Braun turned to the incoming secretary and said, sir, if you'll give me 60 days, we can, we can put a satellite into space. But Medeiros was not so optimistic. General Medeiros said, um, let's make it 90 days, and 84 days later, the Army launched the first satellite. It's not just the success of that satellite, it's, it's th that singular success opened pathways for other defense dollars, because that spirit of accomplishment I mean, it was unfounded at the time. On October 21st of 1959, President Eisenhower approved the transfer of all Army space-related activities to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and the George C. Marshall Space Flight Center officially opened on Redstone Arsenal on July 1st, 1960. The last two years of General Medeiros' command, the Army here had 25% of the Army's budget was here at Redstone. As the years progressed, things are really getting started here on Redstone Arsenal. Take a look at these photos. This is the Red Eye. It was a shoulder fired missile designed for use in the field. The Red Eye entered service in the 1960s and was used for two decades before it was phased out. The Honest John was an unguided rocket. The system first deployed in 1954, then was improved in 1961. It was used for another 20 years. Check out more photos on redstonealabama.com. The 60s, like the 50s, was a time for significant change. Let's check in again with Redstone Alabama's Holly Thrasher with details on an organization that a lot of people here in the Tennessee Valley, Holly, will no doubt remember. Up to this point, the work being done by Dr. Warner Von Braun had fallen squarely under the command of the Army's General John Bruce Medeiros and the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. But with the 1960s came a huge change. Marshall Space Flight Center was formed on 1 July 1960. That's when von, the Von Braun team and the scientists and engineers who worked for the Von Braun team, there was around 4,700 of them moved over to form Marshall Space Flight Center. Now Marshall was taking over the space mission and the Army needed to reorganize. Part of that reorganization was the formation of the Army Materiel Command. That's the four-star command that now occupies prime real estate on Redstone, headed up by General Dennis Vi. We will hear more from General Vi later, but for now, back to the 60s. Major command that was on post at that time was the U.S. Army Missile Command. Now known as AMCOM. What we began doing here at Redstone was was taking the space applications that we had, that things we had learned from that and began developing new systems such as the tow, uh, the Pershing, Lance. Redstone engineers and scientists pushed forward with a new sense of purpose and a new war. It was the height of the Vietnam War effort. Uh, the tow system was used, became the first American-made system to be fired by U.S. troops in combat. Thousands of Americans were drafted to serve in Vietnam, and the people in Huntsville were trying to keep them safe. Technology was really starting to evolve, and even some of the early work on smart bombs was beginning on Redstone Arsenal. But what about the 1970s? Lots of projects were worked on during that decade, but one of the biggest was the creation and dedication of the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Redstone Arsenal donated the land, and the center was officially opened in March of 1970. We are giving you an in-depth look at Redstone through the decades. And we're going to jump into the 80s when we return, and Redstone's involvement in the Cold War. You're watching Redstone Through the Decades, brought to you by Wholesale Jewelry and Redstone Federal Credit Union. 
Welcome back to Redstone Through the Decades. Tonight we're going to take a look at Redstone Arsenal as it approaches its 75th anniversary. Let's jump into the 1980s, a time when the United States found itself in the Cold War with Russia. Let's check in with RedstoneAlabama.com's Holly Thrasher to find out about the Arsenal's involvement. Thanks, Bill and Demetria. It was actually the development of a new weapon system that helped end Cold War tensions. It was called the Pershing II. The Stinger has been used in four wars by every branch of service. It has proved its worth, as has the MLRS, but the Pershing II is what historian Mule Baker says really stands out about Redstone Arsenal during the 1980s. Probably one of the highlights of the 80s would be the development of the Pershing II system, which became the focal point of the negotiations for the INF Treaty. The INF Treaty stands for Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces. It was a move to cool hostilities between the U.S. and Russia and called for the destruction of all ground-launched ballistic and cruise missiles with ranges between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. Baker says the Pershing II was in part the catalyst for the agreement. It was peace through strength. We we never had to fire in anger. Then the Russians came to Huntsville. And it was on a hot day in July of 1988 that the Russians flew into the airfield here and actually came and inspected uh, an old Pershing II facility that had been here on post to make sure that we are in compliance with the treaty. It was mission accomplished. The legacy of the system lives on, as does that of the other systems developed during that time. Laser seekers, the Hellfire. Much of the development of the 80s bore fruit with the first Gulf War. The Patriot is one of Redstone Arsenal's crown jewels. I have personally spoken to soldiers who credit the Patriot with saving their lives during Desert Storm. Redstone was celebrating its 50th anniversary in 1991. And sh shortly after that, during that celebratory time, we brought everyone home. And there was the thing when we were needed, we were there. And, uh, there was a big parade downtown and they brought a Patriot and there was a scud, that a busted scud. It was, it was, uh, flags were flying, it was a happy time. U.S. soldiers went from thinking they would soon be at war with Russia to fighting in the desert when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Huntsville scientists went overseas to modify the Patriot, which was not designed for the desert, even using cheesecloth with end dust on it to stop sand from getting in the cooling system. Desert Storm began on January 17th with Redstone missiles lighting up the night sky. The Iraqis called it the Iron Rain. Just over a month later, the war was over. The Patriot radar system earned its keep in that short time. That brought into fruition all the great work that had been going on since the inception of the arsenal. But while Redstone was reveling in this victory, decision makers in Washington were getting ready to make some big changes. A base realignment and closure committee was formed, and that always means changes are coming. Sometimes they're good, sometimes not so much. That was in July of 1997 that you combined the Aviation Missile Command here and the the Aviation Command from St. Louis. It was huge news. What was once a missile center of excellence was now going to focus on aviation as well. Hellfires are, are fired off of Apaches. You've had toes fired off Hueys and Cobras. So there was, even in the 60s, you had, you they were coming here doing testing. So it seemed like a natural fit. The command now known as AMCOM has become an integral part of Team Redstone and a large one. New buildings were needed to accommodate the growing workforce. We opened the John J. Spartman Center. That was the first administrative office building to have been built here since 1960. But if the Team Redstone workforce thought they were done with changes for a while, they were wrong. More were on the horizon and they would have a huge impact. We're going to hear more about those advances in just a few minutes. When we return, we'll take a look at the last 16 years of the Arsenal. You're watching Redstone Through the Decades. You're watching Redstone Through the Decades, brought to you by Wholesale Jewelry and Redstone Federal Credit Union. Welcome back to Redstone Through the Decades. The last 15 years or so have been jam-packed here on Redstone Arsenal. With new technology, new projects, and new dreams. Let's check in with RedstoneAlabama.com's Holly Thrasher. Guys, it was a new millennium and change was in the air. New buildings had gone up and new Team Redstone teammates had relocated to Huntsville. All was well, at least for a while. Take a look. 
will always remember 9-11. Someone mentioned that a plane had hit the World Trade Center, turned on the TV we had in the office, and we were watching when the, the next plane hit the facility. Senior commander at that time, uh, and the commander of the Aviation Missile Command was Major General Larry Dodgen. It was his first day on the job. Dodgen's first priority was keeping the workforce safe. He sent everyone except essential personnel home. When they returned, everything was different. We had the long lines at the gates and uh, because there was all the inspections that were going on. And now we were at war. Now, unlike the first Gulf War, we were also supporting the aviation mission, which was a critical mission. Then came the 2005 BRAC. Even when this was first coming down, you, you was kind of, would this really happen? And uh, obviously it did. The Army Materiel Command would be relocating to Redstone from Fort Belvoir. A large headquarters building for AMC was built on Martin Road to house Redstone's new four-star command that provides everything for the warfighter, from bullets and food to uniforms and weapons. Where we had a very mobile workforce when we were in the Washington, D.C. metro area. Now we have a pretty much fixed base workforce here. Employees have been with us for a very, very long time. They've embedded themselves into this wonderful Huntsville, Madison County community in the Tennessee Valley. And so we've seen the command change and mature and grow. Uh, to better support our missions, uh, both locally and around the world. The Space and Missile Defense Command, Army Forces Strategic Command, also moved its headquarters to Redstone, although they had had a presence here for years. Over the last 59 plus years, the command has gone through a lot of different name changes. The Sentinel uh, Systems Command, to the, the Safeguard Systems Command, to the U.S. Army Strategic Defense Command. Lieutenant General David Mann says headquarters moved here in 2007 along with the Missile Defense Agency. The Alabama delegation played a big role in making sure that we, we got the necessary funding to build a lot of the facilities that we have here on post, the, the housing areas. Mann says in his opinion, the move was a good one. With all the different organizations that we have here, this is really you know, the epicenter for the Department of Defense in terms of missile defense. Yeah, so kind of a special place again. Redstone really became, like I said before, the epicenter of not only the development of new technologies, but also the life cycle management. It's Redstone through the decades. When we return, we'll take a look at some of the most recent projects here on Redstone Arsenal. Thanks for watching. You're watching Redstone through the decades, brought to you by Wholesale Jewelry and Redstone Federal Credit Union. With all the different organizations that we have here, this is really you know, the epicenter for the Department of Defense in terms of missile defense. But all of those technologies have to be tested before they're put in the hands of warfighters. And what better place than where they are developed? Into the Redstone Test Center in 2009. The Redstone Test Center was stood up in 2009, but Colonel Patrick Mason said it had already existed on Redstone for years, just in a different way. The roots of the organization go back to the Redstone Technical Test Center, which has been here on Redstone, really dating back as part of the old missile organization and the missile test and evaluation element. He says the decision to officially locate a test center dedicated to testing weapon systems and platforms on Redstone was an obvious one. It really created the right alignment between the Aviation and Missile Command the Aviation and Missile Research Development and Engineering Center, both of those had been stood up here in the 90s. The Program Executive Office for Aviation, which had come here in the 90s as well, and then the entirety of the missile community, which had existed here for you know, 70 plus years. These members of Team Redstone are RTC's customers. We will test that piece of equipment, that hardware, that software. We'll put it in as realistic environment as we can and then we'll give them the test data. RTC helps to bring full circle what it is that Redstone Arsenal provides. We're able to not only look at leap ahead technologies and emerging technologies, but we're able to take those technologies, operationalize them, put them into the field, into the hands of warfighter, and then to sustain them over time. And there are no signs that the growth and innovation will slow down anytime soon. We have the ATF facilities on post now, we have the FBI facilities, so we've diversified. And the Terrorist Explosive Device Analytical Center just opened last year. Redstone has always uh, been extremely, and when I say Redstone, I'm talking about just, I'm talking about 
not just the Army leadership here, but the community leadership. It's always looking for ways to, we don't stay stagnant. We, we look at ways that we can continue to, to grow and, and keep, make use of the facilities that we have here. We think we'll continue to be a, a thriving community, tremendous opportunities we look forward to taking advantage of as we uh, continue to shape ourselves to meet mission requirements around the world. Redstone's always been proactive and we've found ways to reinvent ourselves and we will continue to do that. Thanks for joining us for this Redstone special. Thank you to Redstone Arsenal for 75 years of service to the Tennessee Valley. You can catch the entire special and additional content by visiting redstonealabama.com. Redstone through the decades, brought to you by Wholesale Jewelry and Redstone Federal Credit Union.